Well, I, I'd like to do two things. I'd like to um, go over some of the history that uh, has already been mentioned by Eduardo and by several uh, speakers. And then I'd like to talk a little bit to try to go above the, the, the problem and look at general strategy questions and things that have uh, frustrated me personally over, over the years. Um, but first, I, I'd like to th say big, a big thank you to, to you, Xavier, and to the CNES for organizing this. This is really a dream come true for many of us. You should know that we've really had this dream of bringing together all the, you know, all the people who uh, have given their time to this research and, uh, and, and compare notes. I think it's, it's really great. So thank you. Um, now I have to master this technology. I, I'll push this. Okay. This is roughly what I'd like to do. First, um, give a, a brief history of uh, uh, data collection and retrieval systems, going over some of the material that has been mentioned. Uh, I've been involved most recently with a project in the United States called Capella that I'd like to describe uh, generally. And then I'd like to ask the question, you know, in science, when you're confronted with a new phenomenon, there are two things you need to do. You need to make a list, which we've never done, of what is it that needs to be explained. And then you have to make a list of researchable issues. Starting from ideology doesn't get you anywhere. And I think we, we need to go through a turning point in the study of, of this whole domain, away from ideology. We are not, as several speakers have said before, we are not here to prove that we are being visited by you know, aliens from this planet or that star. That may very well be true, but we have not done the basic work. And if tomorrow there was the so-called disclosure that many researchers in in America are hoping for, we would be unable to answer a number of very basic questions, and that's what I, I would like to call your attention to those, those questions today. So I've, I've tried to do a, a rough, this is not complete, and we, we all know it's not complete, but I want to show the major uh, phases of the cataloging of, of UFOs. Um, which is a major think tank in the United States, based in Ohio, to do really the first compilation of cases received by the U.S. Air Force. And they, they issued their famous report in 1954-55. Um, Heineck was already involved as Dr. Alan Heineck as the scientific advisor to the Air Force. Uh, that project was... Uh, the whole Project Blue Book was terminated with the Condon Report that compiled its own um, catalog. As, uh, as mentioned before, um, the, during the Condon Report, the UFOCAT catalog was started by Saunders, and I donated at that point my catalog of about 3,000 cases that I had started with my wife. I had really started collecting things in the late 50s, and my wife and I uh, compiled the first catalog in uh, 1962, based on the files of Guy Quincy and on the, um, on the files of Aimé Michel and on our own data. And then um, Claude Poher, of course, started his, his own catalog, the Gépin, uh, with, uh, and these are not the names of the managers, these are the names of the people who actually worked on the compilation of the database. Uh, Jean-Jacques Velasco, and, and, and now uh, yourself. Uh, the Larry Hatch catalog is inactive. A number of these catalogs have not continued. Um, Dr. Haynes uh, and uh, Dominique Weinstein have continued their, with the pilot sightings database. Um, 
under uh, Bigelow Aerospace, uh, under two organizations, the National Institute for Discovery Science and the uh, Bigelow Aerospace uh, Special Systems, developed uh, a number of catalogs, and that is now inactive. And so you, ca you can see how many are still collecting actively. <laughs> there are a number of other efforts in other countries uh, with Felix, uh, Professor Felix Ziegel in, in Russia, and uh, of course the UK uh, Mi Ministry of Defense and so on. So there are a number of these uh, experiences from which we can draw many useful lessons. Capella uh, was, um, when um, Robert Bigelow at Bigelow Aerospace asked me to help um, create a, a, a data repertory for his institute, I told him, you probably don't want a database. Uh, what, and in, in industry today, I think we've moved um, very much beyond the idea of databases to the idea of a data warehouse where you have a number of catalogs or a number of databases that may or may not have uh, exchanges of data within them based on the nature of the data and the nature of the project. Um, so we built a, a data warehouse with 11 different databases collected in both internally and externally, um, including, for example, the Blue Book database, but also including some proprietary internal uh, data that, uh, that we uh, uh, recovered. Uh, the, the database had a number of links to external uh, non-structured data, like photographs, radar data, recordings, videos, maps, and uh, satellites, so that um, there was a, a very wide uh, range of types of information that could be uh, collected together for specific uh, purposes. Um, so the, the question arises of what is it that is researchable? If tomorrow, um, for example, the US government said, okay, you know, the UFOs are real, uh, there would be a lot of pressure on all of us to come up with a number of very legitimate answers to which we have absolutely no answer. For example, are there global patterns in the data? Well, we think there are, and we have bits and pieces of, of answers, but we don't have something. If you were called tomorrow before the French Academy of Sciences, you would have a lot of trouble talking about global patterns in the data. What are the physical facts of a phenomenon? I don't think we would agree on that if we took a, uh, if we had a general discussion on that. What is a phenomenon? Are there special locations where it manifests, or is it pretty much all over the place? What are the social and cultural factors? What is the impact on humans? That hasn't been mentioned so far in this discussion. And what methodology is applicable, especially what software technology is applicable? So let's talk about global patterns, and I'll go very quickly through these categories. How long has this phenomenon manifested? When did it start? Did it start in, on June 24, 1947 with Kenneth Arnold on, in his airplane? Or did it start in, with the airships in uh, 1896? Or did it start with the Roman Empire? That question is a question that I'm very interested in and I'm working trying to, to, to get some data to answer that question. But I think, again, that question is very open. What are the overall patterns from the available data? Is there a pseudo-random model behind these events? We've talked about waves, but these waves are not periodic. Now, there is a whole field of mathematics that has to do with waves that are not periodic, and they are extremely interesting. They are also very interesting in sociology or in psychology. We have not really looked at that. Um, does it suggest ongoing interaction of something with humanity, something that could be internal or that could be external? 
I think we have to answer that before we start talking about you know, aliens from somewhere. Is there a cyclical patterns of waves that can be used to forecast the timing and localization of future waves? I mean, if that's true, then we can go there with special equipment and catch them. We haven't done that yet. Is it correlated with na known natural cycles, physical, astronomical, biological, and so on? What relationships emerge when witness-centered parameters are taken into account? Does the phenomenon select its witnesses? The physics, okay. We think we know a lot about the physics of UFOs. Well, what are the various types of manifestations? Is an orb, is it a flying saucer? When does a flying saucer turn into an orb? Um, what about light, sound, structured objects? How do they combine in different situations? We have examples of all of those in single cases and in combined cases. How do we sort them out? What are the measurable effects? What can we measure? We, uh, we can measure light energy output, material composition, compass readings, magnetic remanence, radioactivity. There are a number of things we can measure. Are we consistently doing that? And in what cases does it make sense to measure that? Uh, if uh, somebody sees a globe of light coming through the wall of their bedroom in the middle of the night, what are the things you want to measure? What new equipment needs to be designed to improve collection, preservation, analysis? How many cases involve impact on plant life, on insect life? Have we really looked into that? How can insects and microorganisms be recruited as enhanced detectors or as measuring devices? We really haven't done that. Why is there no reliable, authenticated photograph, Francois, uh, of a UAP with appreciable detail? Is it the problem, is the problem with our equipment? Or is it a feature of the phenomenon that it does something so that the photographs are not corresponding to the visual description that a reliable witness is giving us? And we have cases uh, exactly like that. Special locations, what are the characteristics of information-rich areas? Um, uh, the uh, Bigelow Institute actually bought a, a, a piece of land in the middle of Utah where there were intense manifestations over the years and instrumented it so that we could capture everything all the time. Uh, Col de Vence, uh, Yakima Valley, the Orals cluster in Russia, Hesdalen, and so on. I mean, how many of these are there? And are they really significant or not? How does the behavior of phenomenon change when it's confronted with special measures? It seems sometimes that the phenomenon loves gadgets. Gadgets going from cameras, satellites, um, all kinds of uh, magnetometers, it, it likes to play with them. It likes to do something with them. Um, uh, how do you design something that will resist that kind of environment? What could be expected from spatial observation programs at specific locations? Cultural factors. Did the phenomenon really change its behavior in 1947? Or was that a side effect of the American media? It was the end of the war. There were the atomic explosions. There were American mythology and American imagery changed completely in 1947. Um, can we look at other parts of the world and see if there was a change? Um, how does the phenomenon evolve as a function of geography, culture, physical parameters? If you go to India and you talk to people about strange things in the sky and strange lights, and strange creatures coming out of it. They've been talking about that for the last 2,000 years. I mean, what else is new, okay? So uh, how does the culture affect the kind of data or the kinds of reports that we're going to be getting? Uh, I had certainly that experience in Brazil. How does the phenomenon react to human technology, sensors, <laughs> nuclear devices, 
high technologies? Are there global cycles in the phenomenon's relationship to humanity and vice versa? Does it like to that do, do the waves coincide with intense changes, for example, with the landing on the moon or with uh, specific space, um, space projects or with atomic explosions? Does the phenomenon anticipate or mimic our inventions as it seems to be the case with the, um, the, the cigar cases uh, in, in the 19th century? Uh, is that simply an effect of the press uh, or uh, hoaxes? Or is there really something about the, the phenomenon itself in its image, its appearance? And uh, does it show a special interest in social upheavals or wars or uh, times of intense emotional energy in, on our planet? Finally, what's the impact on humans? And this is probably something that has been least analyzed. What is the range of physiological and pathological effects on humans and animals? We have lots of anecdotes, but have, I, I, is there an MD in the room? Is there a medical doctor in the room? You're an MD? You're one. <laughs> um, does that vary across cultures? How do these effects vary with distance, altitude, type of object, time of day, and so on? Under what circumstances does the interaction result in benefits from humans, healing, that's sometimes reported, enhanced consciousness, um, what are the characteristics of situations where it's a threat to humans as opposed to other apparent behavior? And under what circumstances is communication, whatever it is, reported by the witnesses? Finally, methodology. Can analysis disclose evidence of a control system? And by control system, I don't mean an outside intelligence necessarily. I mean, ecology is a control system. You know, the weather is a control system. Uh, the uh, ocean is a control system. We, we're surrounded with control systems. Some of them are artificial, some of them are natural. Does it, is there evidence, is there a way of finding out if it's a control system? Uh, in this room, there is a control system, which is the air conditioning system in the room. The temperature right now is the same as the temperature at 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, can we prove that? Well, we could prove that by starting a fire. You know, if, if we start burning the stage here, presumably there will be some source of cold air that will start running, and we can detect that, and then we know we're inside a control system. Well, can we do that with this phenomenon? Can we determine what is the reference signal? In this room, it would be heat. Well, what is it that triggers, that makes the UFO phenomenon appear? What should the size and scope of the database be in order to support hypothesis testing? Do we have enough data? And that was you know, the question that uh, Mikael asked and that uh, you know, um, Eduardo asked. You know, how, big does, how many cases do we need of what type before we can start asking the questions we want to ask? How sensitive is it to culture, language, epoch? What form of reasoning is appropriate? Deductive, inductive, abductive reasoning? There is a basic problem in epistemology here that uh, we have not posed, really. What are the patterns of mimicry used by the phenomenon? Does it mimic something in, in our behavior? Uh, can we separate the underlying technology from things that it may be simulating? When we see something in the shape of a rocket, is it really a rocket or is it, can it take different, can it present different looks or different images to us? Uh, our technology can do that already. I mean, you know, look at the stealth, look at the, the advanced uh, fighters that we have, look at the, the, uh, the drones. Can, we, we're already projecting simulacra 
in, uh, in a lot of different situations. So this is not um, <coughs> completely weird. And finally, can we test our hypothesis reliably? In other words, given a hypothesis with good statistical support, could a skeptic or uh, an outside skeptics prove the opposite hypothesis? I mean, if you give me a catalog of UFOs and you give me a hypothesis, I can prove your hypothesis. But if somebody else gives me the opposite hypothesis, I can also prove it. And that's a very interesting logical problem. It's not an unknown problem. It's a problem that happens in many cases. It happens in physics. You know, if you can, you can prove that uh, uh, waves and you can prove particles. But waves and particles are not compatible. Okay? But you, you have to deal with the two different situations. You can prove the hypothesis that light is a wave. You can also prove the hypothesis that light is a particle. Now, I'd like to conclude with one, I think, very important observation, that all these things we can research today with the talent that is in this room, with the current tools available to science. This is not like what CNES does. I mean, CNES develops new, new science, new technology, new tools to new sensors. We don't need to do that. We have all the current tools to, to address the problems I have listed uh, without any preconceived ideology and without using the extraterrestrial hypothesis as a dominant hypothesis to be tested now. We can, we can do that with the tools of science. What, what are we afraid of? I mean, that's the main question I've, I've had for many years. You know, why don't we do it? Now, a lot of work has already been done by scientists, by people like uh, Claude Poher, like people like Peter Stuart, people like Alan Hynek. Uh, we've been using our scientific training, and many of you in the room, we've used our scientific training to apply it to this problem. That's not science. That's not what science does. Science starts from, from that, that kind of um, volunteer you know, passion. But then you need resources, you need structure, you need the kinds of things that uh, Michael has been, has been showing us. You need collaboration, you need some form of institution so that you can move forward. So future projects will need long-term vision and support. They, uh, th there are no magical technical solutions. There is no computer you can buy with special software that will solve the problem. The tools, and here I'm speaking as, as a software, you know, as a, as a computer um, geek, uh, the, the tools uh, have to admit unstructured data, which means SQL, you know, we may have to go to a no SQL structure. It has to handle natural language. We, yes, we need structured questionnaires, but by now, I mean, this is 2014, we know how to analyze natural language. Um, we need to process graphic information. The deep knowledge of the phenomenon in the field is essential. The database is only as good as access to the people who put the data in the database. If you don't have those people, and by the way, we're getting older. If you don't have those people, the database is worthless. It's essentially a bucket of bits. You know, it's essentially something in a computer. But you need the people who have the deep knowledge of those cases, the people who remember who went to the field and and studied it. They, you need to support different communities and then localized studies are an ideal test bed and in that respect I'd like to point to uh, uh, Jean-Francois Boedek's analysis which is I, I think one of the posters about a study he did in Brittany uh, of, of a very specific region of France 
where he studied all the cases that he could get and did special statistics. I think that kind of thing on the local level, if you can generalize it to different areas, will be extremely uh, valuable. The, the main thing I'd like to leave you with is that the ufology has no ontology. Someone said earlier that we're in the same situation as a naturalist classifying insects or plants. Well, if you classify insects, you may not know what that insect is, but you, know how, you can tell how many legs it has, how many wings, how many eyes. Here, we don't have that. We don't know. We only, we only define UFOs by exclusion. You know, somebody comes with a report, and it's not this, and it's not that, and it's not the moon, and it's not a cloud, and it's not a satellite, and it's not a meteor. Therefore, it ends up being, we end up calling it a UAP or a UFO. There, there is a problem like that in mathematics. It's prime numbers. If I give you, you know, 521,233, and I ask you if it's a prime number, you have no way of doing that, of knowing that by looking at the number. Now, we're, we're in the same situation. What you do in mathematics, you say prime numbers are among the positive, you know, uh, odd integers that can only be divided by one and themselves. And you test them by looking at all the positive, you know, odd integers up to the square root of that number. And after you do that, you know, which can take a long time if you have a 40-digit number, then you, would find, you will find out if it's prime or not. And uh, the definition we have of UFOs was a definition that uh, Heineck and I produced back in the 60s, which is exactly that. U, uh, UAPs are found among the set of reports that do not correspond to um, uh, all the known natural phenomena that we have tested against. And so we have no ontology, which is a big problem for, you know, for the software. Because in, if the CNES hires me as a programmer to make a catalog of all the parts in this satellite, you know, I would have to be a very bad programmer if I couldn't do that. Because every part in that satellite has a part number and is described very precisely. With UFOs, we don't have that. And we have to handle, you know, it's a, a big challenge that, uh, that we have to tackle with uh, non-structured data. Thank you very much. Dr. Jacques Vallée has collected purported metal debris from UFO cases dating as far back as 1947 that experts are analyzing in a state-of-the-art laboratory. The breakthrough has come with the invention of a, a machine that enables us to look at the atomic structure. And at that point, the, the atomic structure is impossible to fake. This device is a multi-parameter ion beam imager. Uh, Dr. Gary Nolan, a Stanford microbiologist, is using a revolutionary three-dimensional imaging device to analyze the samples right down to their individual atoms. When Dr. Nolan placed some of the fragments in the vacuum chamber of his instrument, he was astonished to find their composition was unlike any known metal. Just one spot and the isotopic composition all the way across. The no matter where he looked in the sample's the jumble of elements, of whether magnesium, iron, nickel, or titanium, the ratio of isotopes didn't make any sense. If you're talking about an advanced material from an advanced civilization, you're talking about something that I'll just call it an ultra material, right? It's something which has properties where somebody has, is putting it together, again, at the atomic scale. We're building our world with 80 elements. Somebody else is building the world with 253 different isotopes. I intend to use the information to try to build something, to try to understand a physical principle that we don't know today. This material was manufactured. It's not natural. It's not natural to the materials that we have around us in the lab or on, on the earth. It does not mean 
that it was necessarily made someplace in outer space. It just means that it was manufactured specially for a particular purpose that we don't understand, and we want to understand it. I, I don't know uh, if it is capable of altering our reality because I'm not sure that we know what our reality is anymore. There are too many things that are changing our reality. We can alter uh, reality in many ways through drugs, uh, through, um, uh, through uh, consciousness impressions, through belief systems, and of course through physiological means. So the phenomenon could use all of that to express itself if it came from the outside. If it comes from um, inside of us, it's even more interesting because it forces us to raise the question of what is reality in the first place? And physics is, is asking the same questions now. Uh, many physicists are asking primarily because of experiments with entanglement of particles and entanglement of atoms, how is it that reality is really uh, perceived by, by our consciousness? And to what extent do we create our reality? Is there such a thing really as space and time? So those questions come from physics. They don't come from ufology. But I think you know, we, can, we can really learn from uh, from what the physicists are doing now. Some physicists are saying that time and space don't really exist as uh, real entities, that they are expressed, that they emerge from consciousness um, taking uh, notice of, um, of our own experiences. Now, if that's true, uh, that certainly opens up many new ways of approaching phenomena like UFOs and, and other phenomena. So uh, Paracelsus uh, and, and others in that era were not simply esotericists. They were, they were scientists before there was what we know of as modern science. But modern science has to come from somewhere. And uh, Paracelsus was primarily a physician, he was a doctor, and he was pioneering with new ways of approaching uh, the healing of the human body. And one of those ways uh, was to look very widely at nature and at, at the other forms of consciousness that may exist in, in, in nature. Uh, I became very interested in all those stories because I was getting reports from witnesses, modern witnesses, of a, a range of entities, a range of beings associated with UFOs that reminded me of the legends that ev you know, every uh, culture on Earth uh, is keeping, uh, legends about small beings or beings that come from the sky or beings that come from inside the Earth that have uh, special powers. Uh, Paracelsus writes about it, but um, uh, many other authors, and of course, we're keeping the memory of, uh, uh, of those uh, observations. Those were actual observations by people that became translated into legend. And uh, when, when you look into that body of, uh, of data, the, the parallels are very obvious. And to, to some extent, ufology is modern folklore. Every culture has had experiences uh, in dreams, in visions, but also in uh, philosophy with the idea of other forms of consciousness. And there is a great temptation to project onto that consciousness some powers that will explain our human experiences. So we, we call these beings uh, gods or angels or archangels or demons, depending on what we think they, our relationship is with them. Um, 
clearly, uh, if you look at the Bible, the, the Bible is a repository of many experiences of that type. And with an interpretation in a framework that is a religious framework. But uh, other interpretations are, are possible. In, for example, the, the case of Ezekiel that you mentioned is, is very interesting because Ezekiel did not have any explanation for what he saw. Uh, at least that you know, very clear case where he describes a machine of wheels within wheels and four strange beings that he could not recognize. He did. I don't think he called them angels. I think he called them you know, uh, four different types of beings. And he was actually abducted by that machine and landed on another mountain far away. And he uh, was very puzzled. He was so puzzled that he uses words that are very, very rare in the language to describe that, that machine and the, the dome on top of the machine and so on. And uh, the, uh, the translation is very difficult because he uses very rare names. So to some extent, he's describing something that's very similar to what abduction witnesses are describing today. You have something? Yeah, else? so this is a breaking story. And uh, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, Christopher Mellon, uh, literally sent this to me about 15 minutes ago, and he wanted me to read it uh, verbatim. So I was going to read this. It's pretty startling yeah, stuff. Ahead. So I'll read it. In the last uh, 48 hours, the public has learned of two stunning incidents captured on film by U.S. Navy carrier pilots earlier this year. One of the cases features a photo of a bizarre flying sphere and a black cube inside that is identical to dozens of other reports uh, by Navy pilots. Uh, these strange objects have been shadowing East Coast naval ops since 2015. They sometimes maneuver in formation and have occasionally been reported achieving supersonic speeds. The other incident produced a stunning detailed photograph of a massive triangular-shaped vehicle that emerged from the ocean and flew vertically straight up and out of sight just past a Navy F-18 operating off the U.S. Uh, aircraft carrier. These iPhone photos taken by the pilots should be released to the public as there are no sources and methods to protect and the national security benefits of raising awareness regarding this issue vastly outweigh any conceivable benefit from concealing the information. It is hard to believe that in the face of such radical and incredible technology within our vast defense department, the only, we only have a so-called task force consisting of two individuals with no budget who are still being off or stiff-armed for access to relevant and timely information by the Air Force and other security organizations. By comparison, 60 years ago in response to Sputnik, America entered the space race, which led to landing on the moon. Our government needs to wake up and address the far greater technology gap that these and many other incidents are revealing. There is obviously a glaring strategic mismatch between the current task force and the technology that has been identified. Why did he send you this? Because he felt it's a developing story and he wants people to be aware that there's really compelling evidence right now photographically that needs to be released. And so you told him you were coming on here, and that's when he sent it to you? Yes, and he said that, that these people need to feel some pressure. Um, they, need to, they need to know that we are requesting, not demanding, but requesting further government transparency on this issue. And he's very passionate about it. He knows of these photographs. The government's we, – we got the story, I think it was yesterday – and the government is refusing to release these photographs. The pilots want these photographs released. The people that are involved with the incident want the photographs released. And so we, he wants the public to know that these photographs exist and that they should be released. And they're currently in the possession of? Uh, he wouldn't reveal that. He knows the person, but, uh, but he said that the government is not wanting them released, and he feels that, they, that we have a right to these photographs. And there's video that came with this story as well. Well, remember, this comes from the very guy who uh, was strategic, Christopher Mellon, in getting those videotaped evidence from the cockpits of those F-18 fighter jets mm -hmm. off the East Coast as well as off the West Coast in 2004, 2015, and ended up with that big story on the front page of the New York Times in 2017. 
Yeah, see, that that's a new thing because if you went to like 24 or 2004 when this all happened, no one was really talking about UFOs in a serious manner. Like It was still something that would be mocked and ridiculed. But to have it on the front page of the New York Times and to have this spokesperson for the Pentagon say that they've recovered off-world vehicles not from this earth, not made on this earth. Like this is a this is a change, right? A, a really I mean even though it doesn't receive that much public attention because it's all happening during a pandemic mm-hmm. and everyone's just and also the news cycle today is so bizarre. Something gets into the news cycle and then it's gone tomorrow because of a new scandal or people find out Ellen's mean or what whatever it is. There's always something new that's coming out. And these these things though they seem to it seems to be there's more of them and more of them coming out and with each new story that comes out people feel more emboldened to tell their story you know i think personally everything changed in december of 20, 2017 when that page uh, a front page of the new york times revealed that secret a tip program and um i know personally because i've gotten ridiculed for decades for the work i do a lot less so recently um people are suddenly raising an eyebrow going Wow, there's clearly something more to this than just you know radar uh, weather balloons and and misidentified aircraft. Jamie, pull up the video of that's in that article. There's a there's an actual YouTube video. There's two. One's from '94. One's from 2013. Let's go with the 2013 one. Um, but these uh, videos are very strange. You, you see these this object. What's interesting too is that okay, this is the one that I didn't see. But that this thing, the way it moves and behaves, the one that's from, I guess it was from the 94 one. This is the 2013 one. This is the one from Puerto Rico. So it's just kind of cruising across the sky. It's hard to track here in this black and white. There it is. Does it estimate how fast this thing's supposedly going? It looked like they were near uh, some sort of like military base or something. Mm-hmm. And on Aguadilla, which is like the West Coast. What, so weird to see. Like, it's not clear what this thing is. So one of the things that I think it's really good to establish. Go, go I'm sorry, but go go, go further ahead in this video to see if maybe there's a better version of it or a better. I sort of check. The other one has a little clearer vi- video. Yeah, there you go. That's much clearer. Like, what is that? Well, if like, that's not a bird, like, yes, you know, moving through the clouds. One of the things I wanted to make a distinction of is the technology, the observed technology that these guys are talking about. So you've got objects with no wings, no visible means of propulsion, the ability to hover, accelerate from a standstill to out of sight in the blink of an eye, right angle turns at high speed, yeah, the- and fly rings around our fastest jets. That is the technology that cannot be confused or explained away as something conventional. So anytime you see an object like we're looking at here, if it performs or exhibits a, a, that technology, maybe it shoots off at a high rate of speed, does a right angle turn at high speeds, um, no wings, no tail, no propulsion, no sonic boom, almost no sound. That's... And they're trying to get a close-up on this thing to see, get a, a better idea of what the shape is. It's very hard to tell. But this, these objects, also one of the weird things is it moves around the same way Commander Fravor described that thing moving around that was hovering over the ocean. That it kind of darts around left and right, right and left, almost like it's just not connected to what whatever our atmosphere is it's like it's moving in a, this weird zigzag sort of a way this is an infrared image right it's not a visible it's not a normal camera i don't know i don't know what it is is that what it looks like I to think you it's the same type of camera that uh, as the one from the nimitz so you're you're looking at the heat signature you're not really looking at a visual picture, right? So that's that's why it's not not you cannot get a clear definition of it. Well, they need better cameras. <laughs> <laughs> well, so as you go yeah, further for, along in the video, it does. Uh, they do get a better view of it. There it is. There you go. Like, what the hell is that? You know, that was one of the uh, more startling 
uh, moments of producing the film The Phenomenon for me was when I met with Senator Harry Reid, who spearheaded the ATIP program, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program that wound up on the front page of the New York Times. Um, I wasn't quite sure when I met with him how where his comfort zone was, and so I was really kind of cautious for the first half an hour of the interview. But then I started, we started to relax and, and get more comfortable with each other, and I decided to kind of push it a little bit, and I said, hey, uh, Senator, I... Uh, met with Gordon Cooper, who later became Mercury astronaut, who told me on camera that there was a landing incident that took place at Edwards Air Force Base circa 1957, where they happened to have a camera crew out uh, near the dry lake bed capturing the installation of a new landing facility for F-86 fighter jets. And it was broad daylight, and all of a sudden this disc appears out of nowhere, and the camera crew turned their cameras on it, and they filmed the landing of this flying saucer on the dry lake bed at Edwards Air Force Base. And I'm telling the story to Senator Reid, thinking, you know, I don't know how he's going to react when I, but this is what I, was, I have him on camera. And, uh, and I said he has the film footage developed. It was good footage. He held it up. He looked at it. It was a disc, you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, eventually he gets a courier jet from Washington, D.C. that flies in, pick up the footage. Senator Reid goes, and it was never seen or heard from again. And I said, yeah, exactly. And I said, did you guys uncover stuff like that? He goes, oh, yeah, it's all there. It's, we, we, we have it. It's all there. And then he goes to change the topic and talk about something else. And I said, well, hold on, Senator. Uh, are you saying that there's evidence that hasn't seen the light of day? And he looked at me, and he kind of pauses, and he picks up his water bottle, and he drinks a sip of water, and that 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 moment seemed like an hour but it was probably just a second or two and he puts his water ball down and he says i'm saying that most of the evidence hasn't seen the light of day so that that for me was such a powerful moment because i'm going look at who this is coming from this is the former head of you know senate majority leader harry reed saying that the vast majority of evidence hasn't seen the light of day and if the president of the united states can't get access to it as i found out when i interviewed all the people around President uh, Clinton, uh, who can? Who has the authority to have this stuff released? And that's something that I would love to know, and I've been trying to find out. So someone does. Someone yes. in some position of government or some intelligence agency, someone in the Pentagon, someone or some group at the highest level of clearance has access to this information and knows about it. Absolutely. Senator Reid said they uncovered all this stuff during the program, and he said the level of resistance that he got from the intelligence agencies was insane. Like, I mean, they did not want this project going forward at the Pentagon, but they pushed and they pushed and they pushed and they got it through. It started in 2007. It went all the way up until it ended up on the front page of the New York Times in 2017. And, of course, now we know that there's another project. But, Jacques, do you know who has the authority to release this stuff to the general public? No, no, uh, not, not in, in this particular case. I was doing my first documentary back in 1997 when I was just naive enough to think I can get an interview with Steven Spielberg. We had a mutual friend involved, uh, this woman, Janet, and uh, she gets back to me and she's like, yeah, so uh, Spielberg's definitely not going to meet with you, but he knows you're working on this UFO documentary. He thinks you should look into this landing case that happened in Africa at the school. And I said to myself at the time, and remind you, know, remind you guys that I was making a film on UFOs, and I dismissed it so quickly because I thought, there's no way that a mass landing with the sheer volume of eyewitness testimony at a school in broad daylight could happen and the whole world not know about it. So I just walked away from that story for about 10 years. 10 years later, I'm doing an event at the National Press Club with, with Leslie Kane, who uh, was um, part of the article in New York Times that came out in 2017. And she introduced me to this guy, uh, Randall Nickerson. And she's like, oh, he's working on this landing case in Africa. Long story short, uh, he's working on a film uh, now, I think it's coming out next year, specifically on just that case. Uh, Dan Farah is producing it. And he said, um, I'm working on the case, and, and if you want to do something with me on it, I, a small piece, I could. So I got back into it. I licensed some of the footage that Dr. John Mack, the Harvard psychiatrist that came and interviewed the school children on camera within a week of it happening. He unfortunately looked the wrong way in London, got run down by a car and died. So I contacted the Institute with the help of Randall Nickerson. 
I licensed the archival footage. We tracked down the witnesses today. We flew them in from all different corners of the world, brought them together. A lot of them were standing right next to each other. These, they came face to face. And one of the things I realized was that there were roughly 100 kids in the playground, broad daylight, aerial school, Ruiz, Zimbabwe, 1994. And they got within arms, arms, some of them within arm's length of these beans and brought these witnesses together for the first time in 20 years. And a lot of them hadn't even told their, their you know, significant others just because they said they were tired of having to defend this. And I myself didn't believe it when I first heard about it back in 1997. And that segment of the film is the most, in my opinion, is the most powerful segment. Because it's very compelling. You've got all these children saying what they saw on camera after it happened, and then you see them 20 years later, and then we go to Africa and we meet with the headmistress, or she was a teacher at the time. We meet with other witnesses. We go to the landing site. We talk to people at the school. That case is absolutely, and it was witnessed by lots of other people in and around the area for several days before it chose a school to land. It's, it's so compelling because the children are all clearly, they're not actors. So as they're adults later, they're all talking about this moment. And it's like they had a religious experience together. Like they're all sharing it and talking about it. And you could tell it's like, it's a deeply moving experience. If, if they were actors they wouldn't have been able to do such a good job because to, to convey the reality of that moment to them, to, 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 to be able to have this interpretation of this event where they're all consistent in the story and they're all clearly still shook by this moment. It's really interesting because if, if you had that scene in a movie, it would take like a really good actor to pull it off and they'd probably need multiple takes. They'd probably want to get the best one. But those kids, the way they were talking about it and the way they were drawing it, you're like, wow, it really does seem like something happened to them. I, I know how credible that the testimony of the children is because I, I, my partner, Rebecca, she's never had much of an interest in, in what I do, making documentaries on, on UFOs. I do other things as well. But when I was reviewing in the studio uh, the archival interview of the children, she just dropped off a cup of coffee and she stopped and went, oh, my God. Those children are not lying. This is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Because look, I ask your audience to don't take it from me. Just suspend judgment for a moment and imagine, hypothetically, if a UFO or several UFOs landed at a school in broad daylight in Rua, Zimbabwe, Africa, and interacted telepathically with nearly 100 school children. Not all of them had telepathic, but seeing the incident, how significant of a story would you give that? Well, not only that, they had the same message. Yes. But the yes. telepathic message was that technology is a real problem. Yes. And there's things that people are doing with technology that are going to ruin the earth. Yes. And they were trying to relay this to children, which is very strange. Yes. You know, yes. I mean, maybe they just thought they were adults because they were the same size as the aliens. I mean, do you think they knew that they were children? Do you think they understood that it was a school? I mean, this is all speculation, yeah, right? Yeah, but I, no, I definitely had to ask myself, look, during the production of the film, Paula Harris actually turned me on to another landing case that happened in Australia in 1966 at a school, and this time there were roughly 300 witnesses that saw a disc land uh, right outside a, a playground in, in Australia. And we went to Australia and investigated that case, went to the landing site, talked to eyewitness testimony, people that jumped the fence at the school playground and ran over to where this thing landed. And then we even interviewed a guy who snapped a photograph of a disc, a Polaroid, back in 1966, two days prior to the incident. So it's very uh, probably that we have, a photo we have photographic evidence, we have uh, eyewitness testimony, and for the first time we've got testimony from a science teacher. So why do these things land at schools? It seems like, and I'm just totally speculating here, but it seems like if if I were going to do that, it seems like a pretty benign environment. And we've had testimony from military guys that we take a fairly hostile position towards uh, things that penetrate sensitive military installations. And, um, you know, so maybe, I'm just saying, maybe, maybe... They, it's safe. Yeah, maybe it's safe. Maybe yeah, it's but safe. we have to stop reacting to uh, you know intrusions by UFOs as a threat. I mean that's the whole thing behind this new task force. And as much as I respect you know the task force, and 
uh, my colleagues and I want to cooperate with them to the extent that we can bring information or resources to, to what they do. But there is more. This is not, should not be looked at specifically as a threat. I mean, with, with the phenomena that we observe, I mean, if they wanted to blow up those F-18s, they could do it, okay? The, obviously, that's, that's not what it's all about. And this idea of just labeling it all as a, as a threat because it's unknown, that's, that's a wrong idea. 90% of the information comes from the public, comes from children, comes, and very, very little of it is made up. You know, in France, I mean, the, the data would, we get, you know, with, at the French Space Agency comes through channels where if people reported something that's found to be untrue, they are going to be called by the police. 